Hi there, welcome back to IndyCar on the 5th of December. Arguments are raging at the moment uh, across the independence movement about a number of things, and I'm still concerned that there's an awful lot of suspicion and backbiting going on between uh, supporters of the SNP and supporters of ALBA, amongst others. Now, this really needs to stop because if the SNP's plan is to go ahead and we have this referendum within the next general election, then all of the parties of independence will need to be on board. There has to be agreement between all of the independence groups. Uh, on how they proceed. Otherwise, this just will not work. So all of the, the backstabbing, the backbiting, the suspicion and the innuendo needs to end now. Despite the fact that many people differ on the, the routes to independence, the fact of the matter is that the SNP has a plan in place. And it's the only plan that they can pursue because the, the British state sets the rules for the Holyrood Parliament, and that means that they have to work within what's there at the moment. So the SNP's plan, as you know, is to turn the next general election into a de facto referendum. Now, there are a lot of things still to be answered by the SNP at its conference in the springtime, and one of these things is the currency. Now, this is an issue which has caused a lot of debate, a lot of argument recently over whether Scotland should adopt its own currency right from the beginning or whether it should, as the SNP has been uh, suggesting, continue to use the pound for a period of time until the Scottish currency is set up. Now, to be honest with you, there, there's a lot of historical um, precedent for setting up currencies almost immediately when you have left another larger um, conglomeration or union with other countries. And most notably, the Eastern European countries have almost instantaneously created their own currencies upon becoming independent. The trouble with the SNP's policy of keeping with the British pound until such time as the Scottish currency is capitalised and the Scottish Central Bank, which issues that currency, is set up and has enough funds there to give that, that new Scottish pound the value that, that it should have. In the meantime, if we continue to use British pounds for all trade, in other words, for importing and exporting and for all bank transactions in Scotland, then the Bank of England, which is the British supply bank, would control the interest rate on Scottish government borrowing. And that could be used by the British state as a big hammer to hit the Scots. It could. Uh, make borrowing, for example, extraordinarily expensive if we were to do it using British pounds. Now, Scotland could use any currency after it's independent. It could use the euro, for example. It doesn't have to join the European Union in order to use the euro, particularly for transactions and trade. It can adopt it temporarily or permanently if it wishes. It could use dollars if it wanted to. Money is just money, no matter what you call it, and you can use any currency to transact business uh, that is freely transferable, and the dollar is freely transferable, and so is the euro. Scotland could have its own currency right from the beginning, but that would need uh, internal investment coming into the Scottish Central Bank from abroad, and that takes a little bit of time to set up. However, the SNP's policy at the moment is a little vague, and I think it needs defining before we go much further, because one of the biggest problems in 2014, if you remember back that eight years ago, was the British state's denial of the use of the British pound. Now, it wasn't actually able to stop us using the British pound. It just prevented Scotland from having a monetary union with the rest of the United Kingdom. And that monetary union would have meant that if, if we had gone ahead in 2014 and become independent under the terms of that offer, that we would have had the Bank of England as Scotland's currency issuer, which as I've said before, puts us at the mercy of the British State Bank, which is controlled and directed by the British establishment. And that would have put us at a disadvantage eight years ago. So there is this concern, and that needs to be hammered out at the SNP conference. Now, in the background, we have groups like ALBA, and we have groups like Salvo and Liberation Scott, who are working on a different thread to, to get independence. And that thread is based on the historic claim of right. Now, this is a document which the SNP feels is ambiguous, and I explained this the other day, that they've actually stated that in black and white, and is the reason why they do not want to use the claim of right as the basis 
for demanding the right to vote about independence, being able to ask the question. And because they've adopted that stance and they're going for the referendum within the general election, the use of the claim of right for the SNP is off the table for the moment. However, ALBA and um, Salvo and other groups which are working in the background are looking at using the claim of right in the way that it was intended to be used. It guarantees the Scottish people, who are a sovereign people, the rights that they had conferred initially in the 1320 Declaration, that is the right uh, to choose whichever form of government they wish and to depose any monarch who is leading them under the control of any foreign state, such as England, and uh, to get rid of any governments which are not serving uh, the people and are not upholding their rights as, uh, as stated in the 1320 Declaration and reinforced in the Claim of Right. Now, the Claim of Right it can be argued by some that it's ambiguous, but the fact of the matter is it is the precondition of the Union, and it remains so to this day. The question really is whether the politicians feel they can use it, the ones who are currently governing Scotland, and whether politicians in Alba who are not in government can claim to use it in a different way. Either way, it doesn't really matter. It's a backstop. It's another means of getting to the same point. However, there's this issue also of recognition. The SNP is going flat out to get a legal vote, something which demonstrates that 50% of us voting in a recognised democratic event inside the United Kingdom won't out of the Union. It's a tall order. I've already gone through the reasons for this. The lack of 16, over 16 year olds, the lack of EU nationals and other uh, foreign nationals who've settled in Scotland permanently, who denied the chance to vote in the UK general election. That is a disadvantage. The advantage is, and I think this is an interesting point made by the SNP, is that gaining independence by getting a majority of votes in a British general election would be impossible for the rest of the world to ignore. And it would be legitimate because the British state cannot boycott its own general election because it doesn't like the way the Scots might vote. It can, of course, deny that the election is anything to do with independence, that it's just a general election and then not recognise the result. Now, we know, I think we all know, that the British state will probably do this, and the SNP knows that too. So it must have another strategy, and that other strategy has to be uh, recognition by other states. And as I mentioned in an earlier broadcast recently, the SNP is working in the background through software, through its trade hubs in, uh, in other countries, uh, on messaging the rest of the world that Scotland is not happy in the Union. It's been denied the, the democratic right to decide whether it stays in the Union or not, and they're looking for recognition. If that were to fail, then there needs to be another route to independence, as I've said, and that route could well be implementing the terms of the Claim of Right, which is a legal document which is still held in the records of Scotland, is still current, I don't think it's ambiguous in any way, although the modern version of it is far simplified and states simply that the people of Scotland have the right to choose the form of government which best suits their needs. And this is a very much stripped down version of the original uh, 1689 claim of right. Remember that the Union Act itself, or the Treaties of Union, date back 315 years. The claim of right dates back even further, it predates that, because having been passed as an act of the Scottish Parliament in 1689, it predates the Union by quite a long way. And it is just as relevant and it is just as legally enforceable as the Union itself, because it's a, a document, it's an act of Parliament, an act of the Scottish Parliament before it, it became part of the United Kingdoms, plural. So there is this still to be used, and I think there is nothing wrong with pursuing that as well. All routes to independence have to be pursued equally at this stage. However, the backbiting all needs to stop. I'm still getting a lot of um, divisive comments, sometimes on my feeds and sometimes on others, between usually the same people, actually, from both ALBA and from the SNP, who, who keep sparring back and forth. And honestly, it's completely divisive. It serves only the British state in keeping the actual movement divided. So we need 
everyone to be on the same side. Even Alex Salmond acknowledged that if the SNP's plan is to succeed, then groups like ALBA, the Greens, uh, the SSP, um, Solidarity, who, whoever, what other parties, whatever other parties in Scotland support independence, need to be included in that um, in that war room, if you like. There needs to be a concerted effort. Old animosities need to be set aside. Old differences need to be forgotten about. And they need to work together for this to work. Whoever has chosen to represent each ward in a general election on the basis of a unitary single issue manifesto has to be backed by all of these parties. Whether or not they're at war with the SNP is irrelevant. This is about making sure that we get that 50% plus vote in a general election. It's a very difficult thing to achieve. But if we're working towards that, and also at the same time other groups are working in other ways, especially towards the International Court of Justice, the SNP can't really approach them at the moment because they're a party of government which is constrained by the British government's rules at Holyrood and they're not actually allowed really and they, they would probably be chased if they went to the ICJ at the moment because the general election hasn't been called, we don't know a date, there is no manifesto decided yet and so the whole thing would be premature. It needs to happen when the general election is called and the terms of the SNP's manifesto are clear and that will happen in the springtime. In the meantime, Gordon Brown, I see, has been wheeling out his latest version of his um, federalism where he claims that there is an appetite in what he calls middle Scotland, whatever the heck that is, um, for a form of extra powers to Holyrood where the Scottish government would be allowed to sign international treaties, but interestingly not about the European Union. Uh, and other little trinkets that Brown seems to think that he can promise, even though he is no longer a politician and has no power to do any of it. Also, I noticed that um, the British government itself has gone very quiet about anything to do with independence. And at the moment, everybody is being distracted by England playing football in the World Cup and by all kinds of other Christmassy things that basically bread and circuses as long as the people of England are diverted away from the disaster of their economic policies by sports and Christmas, everybody will be happy. In the meantime here in Scotland we're not happy and um, to be honest with you I think that the swing in support for independence keeps on growing and it will keep growing actually. I mean 52% in the British poll is remarkable it is probably a lot higher than that, but the British polls obviously don't include 16 and 17 year olds and they don't include the European Union uh, citizens who also have dual Scottish citizenship as well. So there is a huge segment of the Scottish electorate, at least 400,000 people who are not included in that poll and who if they were allowed to vote, I'm sure would vote for independence, or at least many of them would. So again, we're, we're caught in this waiting game. Um, but the main thing I think we need to emphasize at the moment, and I'm not going to use the word unity because it gets thrown about so much, but what I'm talking about here is cooperation instead of confrontation constantly between independence groups. Everybody's working for the same thing. It doesn't matter whether Alex Salmon and Nicholas Sturgeon don't get on. It doesn't matter um, where a party's other uh, policies lie. If they support independence, they must be included in the negotiations which lead to this policy and to this strategy that the SNP is pursuing. Because if they don't do it, there won't be enough support. There'll be too much infighting. They have to settle their differences. There has to be a ceasefire declared between the SNP and ALBA. And both need to agree to it. They need to agree to it fairly soon. I would expect and hope that there will be olive branches extended over the next few months, especially before the SNP conference. It would also be interesting to see if ALBA decides to have a spring conference um, to coincide so that the two parties can actually interact at that point or even just before their conferences so that there's a commonality of cause there. But this requires diplomacy between parties as well. 
as well as the diplomacy of the Scottish people themselves getting behind Salvo, for example. Now, somebody was saying to me that Sarah Salyers is a Salvo member. Well, maybe she is. I don't know. I've never asked her whether she's a member or not. I didn't realize, actually, whether she was a member or not. Somebody says she is. But that doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is that she has discovered exactly what the claim of rights says, and she has also discovered that it is current, and it is not ambiguous at all, that it's still on the statutes of Scotland, it's still in the records of Scotland, it's still an act of Parliament, and it can't be unacted unless the Scottish Parliament were to repeal it, and they haven't. So. It isn't really ambiguous, it's only ambiguous in England who would probably say, oh, you know, this is just a historical artifact. But we know differently. And I think we need all of this. We need the claim of right to be invoked in other areas. And we need the public supporting an approach to the International Court of Justice to demand that we get this democracy and it's recognised when it happens. Otherwise, I feel that there may not be enough of a push. So, while we're all working towards this, let's try and refrain from slagging each other off on social media. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to slag off SNP members. I don't mind constructive criticism, and I will make criticisms when I think they're, they're, they're warranted. Alex Salmond made a big mistake in 2018 when he suggested a currency union, and that blew back in our faces, as we know. But he's accepted that. that. That didn't work. He's moved on. He's doing other things. Fine. Nicola Sturgeon is now about, according to the, the policy that we know about, to repeat that mistake by suggesting that we remain using the British currency until we have our own. And that may not be a good idea. Anyway, let's wait until the spring, see what the conference actually decides. I'll be interested to see whether the SNP conference goes back to its traditional methods of deciding things and allows the membership to vote on the policies instead of the policies being decided on high and everyone else having to keep quiet. I think it's time that the discussion was opened to everyone. And I think the SNP's own conference needs to reach out to these other parties and groups and bring them on board, because at the moment, there just isn't the connectivity that we need, and there isn't the, con <coughs> I was going to say, the cooperation that we need. That cooperation needs to happen right now. The start of it needs to begin now. And I'm hoping that the people who follow this program and who've been suggesting that, you know, that I don't support this or I do support that or I'm a Nicola Sturgeon fan or I'm an Alex Salmon fan. No, I'm not. I'm just an independent supporter like everybody else. And I just want to see it happen. And I'd like to see our politicians growing up uh, and these people who are posting online stop the playground antics and actually get on with each other and start constructively working out how we can achieve this. Because if we're going to go with this policy, and it is the only, um, at the moment, the only democratic means that we have to do it, then let's get behind that. But at the same time, let's not rubbish the idea of using the claim of right if it fails. We need another means. We need the recognition. We need the International Court of Justice to recognise the claim of right as a legitimate act of the Scottish Parliament, which was never repealed, which gives powers to the people. Unless we do all of these things, then I fear that something will go wrong and we will not have another method of um, fighting the fight and winning it. So, I can say, we've got all of these weapons at our disposal. We have all of the people fired up and ready to go, but we have two parties that are butting heads over absolutely nothing. There is no reason for the SNP and Alba to be enemies or have any animosity towards each other. They want the same thing, they have different approaches, but I'm pretty certain that both parties could agree to a strategy if everyone stopped slagging each other off and actually focused on the job in hand. And that is what people out there in the movement actually want to see. Many of us are not member, members of ALBA or the SNP. Many people are just ordinary punters who want to see this done. And they want the politicians to stop bickering and fighting with each other over past indiscretions or past arguments or whatever it might be. Let's grow up here and actually get on with doing this. You don't see this kind of division 
even allowed in parties like the Tory party. Everybody follows the party line. Everybody votes in favour of things. We want to beat them. We have to be just as united as they are. And we need to get out of the United Kingdoms because at the moment we're a kingdom held prisoner. We are political prisoners inside a political union which is meant to be voluntary but isn't. And as far as I can see, that's quite a, a simple case to make to the International Court of Justice or the International Court of Human Rights. We have the right to democracy and we're being denied it. And I don't see any reason why the people of Scotland shouldn't put their own delegation together to make that case. That is a separate issue almost, but it's fundamental to everything. Our politicians need to listen to the movement. The movement will then get behind the politicians and everything will work. But without that connection and without that reaching out, nothing will happen. I mean, I remember, I think it was um, Winston Churchill was once um, accused of something. And I think it was one of his superior officers said to him, familiarity breeds contempt, Churchill. And Winston said, well, without familiarity, it's very hard to breed anything at all, sir. And that's the whole point. Without that gelling of the entire movement together in one go, you can't generate the, the momentum necessary politically and socially to get the job done. And that's what we need. And that's what I'm calling for today in this programme. I'll see you soon. Have a great day. Bye for now.